Hello everyone, this is Denise from Plant Based Mama. Um, today we've got a very interesting guest. His name is David Laris. He is an Australian of Greek origins and David's going to be sharing his story on how he recovered from lung cancer. Hi David, how are you? It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you today. So David, you've been described as a celebrity chef, a social influencer and also a, an entrepreneur, philanthropist. You've done a bit of work with um, Gordon Ramsay, I believe. So, so I, I did a show with, with Gordon, really big hit um, called Faking It. That episode went on to win the BAFTA, I think, and or at least the contributing ep episode for the BAFTA and an Emmy. And, um, you know, I'd been doing other, other media work in London at the time and um, sort of, you know, I was at that point where you could stop on the street. Now, David, it's always been your dream to have your own restaurant, hasn't it? I believe you've had several, but your um, your big dream came true in 2003 uh, in Shanghai when you got your dream restaurant. And I mean, if you've been around long enough and you spent time in Shanghai, you may you may well know Laris was probably the most well known restaurant in in China um, for a good seven seven years. We were the stopping point for all, all major celebrities and major business guys and so on and. I was involved in the early days of a lot of the fashion industry and uh, launching in China, doing the major events with Prada Chanel as part of the F1 launch. Uh, you know, a lot of these big initiatives that happened in that period of time when Luxury was dumping a lot of money into China to kind of take market share. And I'd always loved China. I, I, and I worked in Hong Kong and I loved Asia. And, you know, the adventure of Asia was still very much appealing to me, still, still is, I guess. Um, I, I, I've, I've tried, resisted being anywhere too normal. <laughs> You know, then, then I was sitting right in the middle of like a very sexy, very cool hospitality business. Um, you know, so yeah, got very involved in that, became very well known, um, built, a, built a pretty high profile uh, at that point, uh, then went on to start my own firm. Mm -hmm. Long, long, long and, explanation, sorry. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, you, your career is very diverse. I mean, it's very typical of someone who's ended up in, um, in China doing yeah. a whole lot of things that they would not normally have done um, at home. Um, and Plant-Based Mama and Essential Wellness were very much about um, helping families move towards plant-based lifestyle. Yeah. And I know that that is also a passion of yours. <coughs> Excuse me. But today we're here to find out a little bit more about your own personal health challenge, mm -hmm. which is, is very interesting. Uh, so about a week ago, you shared with me that you had... Um, you had started using ESIAC at, at some stage because yeah. you had lung cancer. Would you like to tell us more about your, yeah. your health challenge? And yeah, um, yeah. yeah, because that's what we that's something like, you know, you can go to someone's LinkedIn page. We could get a whole lot of data about you, but actually yeah. your personal journey and your health challenges is uh, of great interest to us. Yeah, so and, and it's funny because for when I was going through, um, you know, the healing and, and dealing with everything, I actually didn't talk a lot about it. I kept it kind of very close, um, really just close friends and a few close business associates, um, because I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want it to be an issue. Um, and so, so, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you about how quickly I got back to work actually, um, in a second. But uh, so I was doing, I went to do a routine. Um, uh, check up, you know, annual physical, which which we all do in China, right? Uh, it's and I remember my assistant. For the biggest, yeah. yeah, exactly, right. Well, this is this is this is my my the company covers a pretty nice, uh, you know, insurance package, and so uh, you know, my assistant um, Eric, who you've met, he said, um, David, you know, you haven't done your health checkup, for, you should do it, and he kept pestering me, and eventually just booked me in because you probably figured out Eric just runs 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 the schedule. Um, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I went, went, went in and did the normal thing that I do every year. And, uh, you know, and, I, and interestingly in China, they still do lung, like chest x-ray as part of the physical, yes. which is not common in a lot of other places. So um, did that and, you know, but I got that dreaded call back. You should come in and see us. And uh, the, doc the, the doctor just, just sort of said, I think there's a problem here and this could be an issue and you should go, we should look a little deeper. And of course did that and then very quickly, uh, you know, I had that, you know, I guess you, we all we all maybe imagine what it feels like. I, I know I did to be sitting there um, and being told some news like that. Um, so uh, I, I think I pretty, took it reasonably calmly, as calmly as one can. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and my, my, I guess, like after, after the, this was David, like three years ago, three years ago. 
three so years ago. Three years ago, yeah. So um, got got that information, that got the news, and I guess after after dealing with the initial shock and the impact of that, and you know all, all, all the stuff that comes along with that initial um, phase uh, of dealing with that, so something like that, where you're told, you know, you look at the statistics, it's not good. Um, I, I kind of took the view that I would immediately go into into sort of battle mode, which is me. I mean, that's uh, I'm, I'm a fighter, so um, you know. So I immediately started researching, and and thankfully, my, my wife is also somebody who's kind of like very much on an alternative view uh, of, of wellness and medicine, and doesn't necessarily follow the you know the, I guess the what I call the you know, the status quo pharma led um, conventional. Mm. The conventional way of treating. Yeah, 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 and I and I and I sort of went and I, and I went down this very very deep rabbit hole. Um, that that kind of you, I don't I don't I, you know I've always questioned what I the very first tattoo I have on here is called question what you're told. Um, so I, I I I've always done that anyway. Um, but this really sort of took me down a very deep rabbit hole, and I think my my journey was one of wellness and one of also discovery and really rethinking the way that people uh, approach just wellness in general um, and their, their daily lives in a way that medicine has kind of lost its way or at least doctors perhaps in a very large way and I don't think they do it on purpose I don't think there's any great conspiracy by doctors to cause harm I just think that they when, when you have a pharma-led uh, industry that completely ignores you know uh, nutrition and um you know, uh, holistic living and, and, you know, the balance of, of energy and, and, and mm -hmm. you know, generally, you know, that's with plenty of science to support it. Um, I think there's a problem, right? Because then, you know, they've, they've been bought without realizing they've been bought. Um, and the, and if you look right back to the early days of, you know, where, where, where institutional medicine began, like with the Carnegie's and, you know, the, the other great American families that kind of decided they needed to shift, you know, the medical, Plan, let's say education to being farmer based so they could provide and if you've got it down, down that rabbit hole but it's an interesting one to explore uh, and I just say to people just just look up the stats about who got involved with you know getting on the boards of of universities early on um, yeah. you yeah. know who, who drove that. yeah so our, our, health, our health outcomes are, are a result of the decisions that were made decades ago about well, how ago. doctors were trained yeah yeah you know, there was a camp, there was a camp, there was a there was, there was an actual campaign against what they called quackery at the time, um, in order to try and shut down, you know, anyone who was looking at holistic medicine and only, only give accreditation to those who were doing a MD, uh, you know, degree and you know. And so anyway, it was it was a conscious. I think it's hard not to say it wasn't a conscious effort to shift the way that medicine was sold and and given to people now. You could understand there's a balance there as well. I always try to take a balanced view in everything I do. Um, so, mm -hmm. one, so anyway, one of the rabbit holes I went down was was that one, and, and really starting to, which allowed me to really properly question the advice I was being given by traditional medicine, right, and by the oncologists. Um, and oncologists, you realize very quickly, um, uh, are just dealing with three types of approaches to dealing with cancer. But let's come back to that. I think I think I needed just to kind of conclude the earlier. Uh, comment, which was so after discovering that I actually had a I had a, 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 a lung a lung cancer, a tumor in my left lung. I um, uh, sort of decided that I had a choice to stay here, which or go to Australia. I, I took the option. Again, I was fortunate enough that I, I had the means to do that, and just went went and saw one of the best um, you know uh, lung guys in Sydney um, at the Royal North Shore. Then went he he, he confirmed everything. I went and saw one of the the best surgeons in Sydney at the same hospital and literally within, I think within being diagnosed um, and being, you know, deciding I was going to do surgery as my main first uh, sort of uh, uh, approach to things. Uh, I, I was within three weeks, I was, I was in, in surgery. So, uh, you know, but so as I was saying earlier, checking one of those, going, going down the rabbit hole of, of exploring what, what was happening to medicine and, you know, allow, enabling myself to be informed, which is the advice I'd give anybody is be informed. Um, you, you know, you, you, you don't have to just take one opinion as being the only opinion. You can, you can form your own opinion. You're, you're, you're empowered as, as, a, as a sentient being to be able to make your own choices and to question and, and you're allowed to ask those questions and no one should ever make you feel stupid for asking those questions. I think that's, that's, that's important. So there's a lot of knowledge out there. Um, mm -hmm. 
right? Uh, so, so, and then, and then, and then I, at the same time, I started looking at what alternatives I had. So I, I, I'm a big poker player and I, I love maths and I, I like statistics. So I started really, you know, after part one of just finding out information, I started looking at stats and evaluating statistics of, you know, what my probability were, was in different types of treatments. And this is why I led to taking, you know, surgery was going to reduce, you know, change the numbers for me a little bit. Um, you know, then I knew that, you know, doing chemo, for example, I studied the actual type of chemo that they would be putting me on, um, which is standard. I mean, as soon as you have lung cancer, you do surgery, you do chemo, that's it. Um, there's no other way they look at it. Uh, so, and I'll tell you some stories about my meetings with those guys um, later, but uh, then, then I, I, um, I decided that uh, chemo was not for me. Um, that's statistically, f firstly, I, I didn't buy into broad spectrum chemo being a cure for cancer or a solution. I think it can cause more harm, but again, I'd never tell, I would never tell anyone not to make their own decision. You know, I mean, I think there are cases when it can be helpful, but my view was for me, it wasn't going to help me. And interestingly enough, the honor college that I was seeing um, was a guy who wrote a paper. Uh, I started, I found out all about him. I, I, I researched his previous work he'd written or the, a lot of the papers he'd written. And I discovered that he'd written a paper a few years ago that said that basically there was about a 3% margin uh, between doing chemo and not doing chemo um, of, of, of different. So I was like, wow, right? So, and I, I sort of said, well, you're the guy who wrote the paper, man. <laughs> and he's like, no, yeah, but yeah, but we sh you should still do it. I was like, yeah, but you wrote the paper that said there's a 3% variance. Um, so if I do all the maths, really, I'll take, you know, if I look at the harm versus, um, you know, the, the percentage variance, then really it's not a hard decision to make. It's a scary decision, but it's not a hard decision um, because there's a lot Literally, of- Literally, it only adds a couple of days to, to any sort of uh, yeah. life possible extension. Yeah. People yeah. don't realize. And, and, it, and it just can, can you know, get, I think it would, you know, screws your immune system completely. So anyway, anyway, so I came armed with maths, uh, with stats, and uh, with a lot of information. And um, I, then, then, so that was that was the second key part. I would also, uh, you know, advise people to, you know, really look at the stats, really understand what they're being told, and be, and challenge their uh, oncologist to kind of come up with the answers. They'll they'll get upset. They'll they may even try and make you feel stupid. It's kind of what they do. There's a, there's an inherent a arrogance in in in, in medicine, and, and and particularly in oncologists. Um, and you're, you're kind of labeled as one of those people um, if you if you have an alternative view um, and they really just, you know, but still, I'd say do it, be challenging and, um, you know, and they're they not gods. Um, they, they are people and, and um, you know, we need to kind of just remember that at times. Then, 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 um, then I started looking at alternatives, what, what existed, what, 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 what sort of possible you know, cures, remedies, you know, what could be done. So the first thing I struck upon was ultimately it's about building immune system, right? So I, I, I really went about, um, I saw a couple of great um, natural healers and, you know, very qualified, very learned people who were looking at holistic medicine and, you know, and I started with healing the gut, like looking at everything that I could do to heal the gut in order to improve my overall immune system. Um, and, and that was done, I had a very, very strict regimen of um, taking certain supplements, probiotics. I mean, the whole range of things. I, I mean, it was insane. I went, I went pretty hardcore on, on that side of things. <clears throat> May I interrupt you? Yeah, of course, um, anytime. Yeah. When you were going through this, because we're, we're interested in, in learning about the, the, the important lessons that you learned about this health challenge, challenge through this health challenge. Yeah. First of all, it seems as though you, you, you re-evaluated how you viewed medical advice, like conventional yeah. medical advice. Yeah. So you, you look as, it looks as though you did a combination of both conventional, which is the surgery, because yep. you've got a choice of surgery, radiation, or chemo. Yep. That's basically yep. all that yep. they offer yep. in conventional. So you refuse to take chemo. Well done, because in a lot of cases, it doesn't really add much, and it mm. does ruin the immune system. Um, but when it came to choosing the alternative, um, now we, uh, our listeners can see you are a very thorough person. You wouldn't have achieved the goals that you have currently achieved if you didn't do your homework. How did you sort out fact from fiction, fraud from legitimate um, guidance? Yeah. Because 
uh, one of the things that was quite quite serendipitous that we actually managed to get in contact with each other because I had a bottle of Essiac just in my refrigerator in a photograph that you saw. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I have found is that um, a lot of people get very confused about how to separate what industry tells them and what has worked for people because quite often what works for people, for example, a uh, plant-based diet, um, meditation, um, getting rid of your shit, you know, any emotional crap that you've got. I think there's about nine things that people who survive from cancer tend to do. Yeah. And very few of those things are actually provable by scientific research. Like JAMA doesn't have, JAMA doesn't have, uh, the, the Journal of Medical Association yeah. does not, American Medical Association does not have um, uh, evidence-based uh, statistics or papers to say this works. So how did you go about doing that? What, what, yeah, what did you do? Well, so, so I, yeah, I think that's a good point. So I had, I had a whiteboard, actually. I'm a big whiteboard guy. I, I, I actually have up on my whiteboard. And I, up until recently, I, I only rubbed it off recently. I, I did take a picture of it. Um, I, I, I grafted out, um, you know, mind, body, soul. And under each of those areas, I, I had written a set of, you know, actions and disciplines that needed to be undertaken in order to, you know, cr create optimal 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 wellness um for cure for being able to self heal um and create mm -hmm. optimal again physical physical body mind you know uh, in terms of you know mental state and 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 quite frankly soul you know the, the kind of like the that that intrinsic thing that um one uh, i think also adds adds to it whether it's whether it's real or whether it's uh, another it, it's another kind of um, way that the body and mind can come together to create, you know, something that's very powerful in, in self-healing. I, I think it's it's important. So, we'll call, you know, you can call it faith. And for me, it wasn't religious faith, but just, you know, I, I, there's, there's a component of soul. Um, uh, so, so, anyway, back back to just to distinguishing the difference between the two. So, uh, I think there was a, there's a lot there's a lot of um, fake stuff out there on, on both sides, right, on all, on all fronts. Um, I, I did look at a lot of testimonials. Um, I, I did speak to a lot of people that had dealt, had used things like Asiac tea. I looked at the whole history of Asiac tea. You know, I, I studied right back to, you know, the, the origins of it. I know a lot about it. I mean, so like, you, you know, so, you, you know, this is when I don't, I don't often talk about it, but like, I do know a lot about these different types of singular things. So uh, I, I went back, I, I, you know, in my assessment of the history of Asiac tea, you know, and just some of the actions that were taken along the way by the FDA, um, you know, in, in trying to kind of buy it and then then eventually just shut it down and all the buy it, ban it, buy it, ban it. Yeah, yeah, crazy. yeah. So all of that just didn't smell right. There's a lot of there's there's a great documentary about about um about it. Uh, I think it's just about the, the cancer. I forget the name of the. I'll have to remember the name of the documentary, but it does go into the the history and and so I also you know so so I I did do a lot of looking into that, that just say Asiac, for example, and, and I truly believe that, you know, for me anyway, there's something there. Um, I think that there's enough clinical tests. So if you have, if you evaluated clinical trials as being a way to evaluate the effectiveness of, of something, surely the, the, the work that she did and all the people that had testimonies about, you know, coming in sick and going out well, you know, that's, that's a clinical trial. It just wasn't recognized by a body. Um, so there is evidence, and I think the evidence exists if you look for it. So you know, and and you know, are all these are all these people, all these families, all these everyday people lying about their family or you know their father being cured or their being? I mean, really, is, what what is this? You know, you know, one talks about conspiracies. Is it is it you know? What well, conspiracy can in that case works both ways. It's just bizarre to say that if you say Esiac works, then you're a conspiracy theorist or you're a quack. But if you refuse to look at the evidence well then you're you're kind of logical and somehow everyone else is just making it all up so mm -hmm. it, there is there isn't a balanced view going on at the moment right so uh, it would be great to actually see them do clinical trials using as the but there's no benefit to that because you know you can't patent it you can't sell it in a way exactly. that right it's owned by the it's owned by the people so if you can't patent it no one wants to research it or fund research into it. So, you know, uh, there you go. And then, then the official bodies that are supposed to be, you know, responsible for that don't get the official, 
you know, um, research, in which case it can't be credited, cycle continues, drug, drug companies win. Um, and that's, and, that, and that's, how, that's how the vicious cycle uh, obviously has bought, and has bought in many ways the institutions that are supposed to protect people from the actual, you know, drug companies and profiteers. So uh, mm -hmm. it is what it is. Anyway, as long as, long as one, one is aware. So, so how, staying on that topic for a second, um, beyond, beyond that, you know, I, I, I mean, again, if you just start the fundamental of, you know, if creating uh, your, if setting your body up for optimal health and, and building the strongest possible immune system is the starting point and you know things like Eziac tea, you know almond kernels, and again, I'm not recommending anybody does any of this stuff. I'm saying I'm just putting it out there, you know that these are things that I did. So I ate an enormous amount of, of, of apricot kernels, which have potassium cyanide in them, um, which I again just saw lots of testimonials. I saw people not dying from eating them. So you know apple seeds. So again, not saying anyone should do this. I'm saying this is what I did. Um, you know, a, a large amounts of Eziac tea. I was doing it three times a day, way above the average recommended, you know, daily maintenance dose. Um, I was doing large amounts of vitamin C, large amounts of B, you know, just, just really, uh, you know, there's a lot, there's some protocols that I was just putting, um, you know, a, a lot of these things in, in, into me. But at the same time, I was managing gut health and I was building immune system. So I did that. I did, I did go plant-based 100% for I think close on a year and a half, two years. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I, I gave that because I do fundamental. I did, I do and do, still do fundamentally believe that, you know, um, it, it is a great way to give your body a chance to really be at optimal kind of um, immune uh, fighting, you know, um, capacity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it does, it does clear the way for the, it, it, it creates less distractions, uh, I think, for the body to heal. Um, yeah. Than, than processing large amounts of, of, of animal protein. So, I, and I, I do fundamentally believe it. Loads of green, anything green, like loads, I just would bombard myself with just green, 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 green. I was, yeah. I, I took one. That's very much, that's very oh. much, sorry to interrupt, that's yeah. very much a Gershwin, a Gershwin yes, well, yes, uh, yes, protocol, it, it isn't is, it? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, and I did, I, I think that, um, you know, I did also, I, look, I read a lot about his work. Um, it was amazing. Yeah, amazing. So, and you know, I also did a lot of research on what was going on in certain um, institutions in Latin America and places where they were deregulated and were able to kind of again, yes. the, the, the evidence is there. What can you say? So, I, I wanted to go back to just the, you know, the um, the immune, you know. So, immune so yeah. So, apart, apart from taking the the additional supplements, what I did and what I'd advise anyone to do was I I, I went and did speak to someone who was very well, you know, an expert in in kind of uh, you know, wellness, gut health, you know, um, you know, uh, total, total holistic medicine and so on. And someone who'd qualified and was working in a, you know, in a very reputable um, clinic. Uh, and I, and I, I did every test you could possibly do. So I tested, I, I did it like everything <laughs> that you could do in order to test. I knew every, every mineral in my body, every chemical I knew where I was deficient, where I had more or less, I knew what I was, what I was prone to, um, being able to absorb more of or less of. And I mean, literally I knew everything. I had like, you know, reports this thick uh, about uh, my toxology, everything. So I used that as, as a foundation. We're working with this particular person to figure out the optimal program for me. Um, you know, and that was built, up, built on plant-based and then, you know, and then all the additional supplements that I was taking. I actually did more even than he was recommending. So, because I figure, you know, I mean, what, what the hell, you know, you, you go all in, right? So I, I went, I went pretty hardcore, um, you know, and, and I'm three years in, I just had my, and I still do, I do, I do, I do do a PET scan every, I was doing a PET scan every six months for the first two years. Um, Cause although I'm a gambler, I like to hedge my bets a little bit. So I, I still do those tests. I did, I, I do one, I did one, my annual one. I'm still, and I'm completely, you know, cancer free three years on, right. From, and I, interestingly, I, I, I went in, when I came out of surgery, it had migrated to my lymph node, um, which Not was much. which was a massive error. You, you're frozen, by the way. I don't know. Um, uh, there you are. You're back. Yeah, you're back. Back. You're back now. So, you know, and so I got that dreaded call where I'd come out of surgery. They did the test. They they removed the lymph node, um, and you know, it had it had spread to the lymph node, and that's when you know 
the urgent need to step in and do the um, chemo protocol became even more important to, from their perspective. And I respect that. And I know they were right. kind of from a position of, you know, being good carers. I just didn't necessarily agree. Um, and I, my oncologist was, I mean, it was, I was in Sydney and um, my oncologist was calling me, you know, every other day telling me I had, I had to get in and start the, the treatment. And I ended up, you know, blocking the number, I'll be honest with you, because I, I just sort of had made my mind up, right? And my family were one, were great. I mean, I didn't know how, you know, mum and dad obviously would all, you know, they were kind of very cool. They sort of said, make the choices you want to make because it is also the family, you know, I've read a lot as well and hear from folks that you get a lot of pressure uh, when you make yes. a decision like that, right? You know, um, but everyone let it be my decision and we're very supportive and, you know, because again, if you, if you, you know, popular, you know, modern, you know, so-called modern folks are going to tell you, well, why aren't you doing chemo? Everyone's doing chemo. But I, I walked into that room and I saw everyone hooked up to those um, chemo machines. And it, it just, it just sort of, I just thought, I, this has got to be another way. I can't do this. This is not for me. I, I have enough of a fighting chance to not have to do this. Um, you know, although I was given what, I think I was given 30% chance of being alive in three years um, by the oncologist at the time. And I think so. Uh, maybe less, I can't remember the exact stat, but something in that range, um, three to five years. So, um, you know, very sobering things. Uh, so you make decisions. So every decision you make is is very much one that you want you want to pay close attention to and and uh, do your homework on, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. so, yeah. So, and, and so ESIAC T did become a big part of my life and still is, and still is. That's why I was so happy to find it um, here and ready-made um, in China. Yeah, it was. It's it's all part of the the whole sort of plan of things. It was very serendipitous for me to actually um, end up as a distributor of a very high quality um, SEIC tea because that's another that's another part of it. Uh, our tea actually has the roots and um, mm. sheep's oral roots, and it's actually grown in Canada. Just um, it's uh, near Bracebridge, Ontario. Our supplier, Robert Henry. Hi, Robert. <laughs> he actually hand harvests harvests the uh, herbs himself, yeah. and so that's a very important part of it because uh, you know getting reliable suppliers. As you know, in China, it's a frightening thing that there are people who who will base their recovery on the integrity of the people supplying them of uh, these sorts of products. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, you know, it's all very important. We've had a, a, a few discussions in various green groups about the quality of the plants and vegetables, you know, the fruit and vegetables here in China. And that's also another big issue when it comes to the Gershwin, um, Gershwin protocol of getting, you know, quality organic um, plant-based foods. Mm, mm. One, of, one of the questions that I would like to ask you is if you could just briefly give us an idea of why you think possibly your body manifested because i'm assuming that the, your late 40s i'm actually i just turned 50 um last year yeah okay so, yeah. so this would have been around about mid 40s that your body had to show the signs i mean the evidence is that we we create these diseases you know decades before we actually see the symptoms of it hmm. um if you could share with us why you think you possibly manifested it what you learnt from it yeah, and yeah. how that is going to approach your um, basically so this this is getting to the very last question is yeah. what message would you like to impart to our listeners to encourage them on their health journey because the one thing that I have noticed is that the people who recover or who go into what's known as spontaneous remission have usually made this this health challenge into something that has become their greatest teacher. And they actually end up with the quality of life that is far better than they have ever, ever known before. So I'd just like you to share briefly on, on your thoughts on that. Very true, actually. Uh, I'll come back to that at the end, but that's that's so true. And you you hear, and I have heard, and a lot of, a lot of people talk about uh, how cancer can be a great teacher, which, which um, I also certainly uh, believe it has been for me. Um, so, so, you know, and there's a lot of, I mean, this is a very interesting part of the journey. Um, you know, you know, what you, what you, I sort of say this in a particular way. Um, 
Y yes, it, it's it's transformative if you let it be, right? And you, and it needs to be in order for it to be successful because uh, you have to one hundred percent commit to it. Now, I'll, but I'll come back to the earlier part. But let me just start at the beginning. You said how do, how do I think it manifested? Well, you know, I mean, I I. I, I lived in China for many years, <laughs> so I'm sure the quality of the air didn't help. Um, I, yeah. I, I worked in kitchens for many years. I'm sure the quality of the air in kitchens didn't help. A very high stress uh, job. I mean, you know, be, you know, you know, I was um, working at the top of the industry. You know, I was at the top of the industry, um, and you know, b being a dedicated chef at that level and at the same time running businesses, you know, it's it's fairly full on, right? I mean, I I was. I was very, very um, sort of, I think, highly charged, highly strong person, um, very driven. So, um, you know, I worked all the time. So that was, there was that, there's that, there's that stress, which I think is a major comp contributor, quality, quality of air. Um, I kind of lived a bit of a rock and roll lifestyle, I guess you could say. Um, so um, I, I definitely, there was a lot of, you know, I won't go into details, but there was definitely a lot of partying and, you know, and um, so again, I guess best way to put it is rock and roll lifestyle. So uh, I, th I think all of those factors, you know, um, contributed to, you know, ultimately not having in optimal health. I think I was kind of lucky that I, I was, I mean, maybe born with good genetics as far as being tough, you know, but at some point it, that catches up with you. All right. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, there's a bunch of factors. Um, and, you know, also being, being a bit of a sugar addict, I think was a major part of it. Uh, yeah, I just ate like, I mean, way too much. I think again, you're doing a lot of like, it's another, it's another fuel, right? You're just burning, you're just running on fumes sometimes. So, um, and I, one of the things I, I didn't mention was a major protocol is I cut out 100% sugar, um, during the, particularly during the, um, first sort of two and a half years, like no sugar whatsoever. I would have sugar and fruit, natural juice, whatever, you know, but even within, even within, for the first year, even sugar that I didn't do like a lot of like veg, fruit, fruit juice because of the high uh, sugar content. Um, so I really, really cut down sugar to a point where if I tasted anything like that had a little bit of sugar in it, it just tasted extremely sickly. Um, I do indulge again every now and then now, but um, I, I certainly just went hardcore, zero sugar. And I just tell you, sugar is, sugar is the devil's, um, you know, thing. And I think that may have also contributed and cancer loves sugar. So um, yes, it, does. it loves it. So, you know, anyone is trying to deal with sugar, uh, sorry, deal with cancer, they should just immediately cut sugar out as, as a first, first thing. Um, and it's, it's funny enough, I, I, I've heard oncologists say, oh, don't worry, you know, you know, ha ha have your sugar, have your, have your, 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 your cookies or whatever with the, whatever it is. And, you know, you've got the chemo. It's like, wow, you know, come on, you know, and, yeah. and, and if I would say to people, even if you choose chemo, you know, in order to deal with chemo, your body is just about to get ripped apart. So optimal health is important, even if you take that choice. It isn't like a shortcut to saying, I don't need to do all the other things um, for optimal wellness because I'm doing chemo. In fact, you should do even more because you're doing chemo because mm. your body's going to have to fight that as well. So sure. anyway, anyway, I was saying, so I think, I think those, those were the contributor factors to, to, to you know, to, 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 um, to why I got why why it happened. I mean, it's it's something that you know, fifty percent of men in the Western world will deal with some form of cancer in their life. One in three women will deal with some form of cancer in their life, and you know, again, it'll affect everybody one way or another, indirectly through, you know, um, uh, you know someone they know. So everyone's mm -hmm. going to be touched by cancer, and no one talks about it. It's like a dirty word. It looks like yeah. those statistics are actually quite low compared to what the ones that they're predicting are going to happen. Oh, they're increasing so all the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's 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 most recent, and then that's only talking about, you know, one, you know, the Western market, so or the world, I should say. So anyway, look, no, no doubt it's going to be more. No doubt it's going to be a lot more. We're 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 we're, we're just polluting ourselves continually. So anyway, um, about about how 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 it um, you know, so I did also like, you know, when you get close to really dealing with your mortality um it's a very interesting part of the journey um and i think it's initially very very scary um but uh once you get closer to it the closer you get to it and the, uh, i think the karma you well at least i i felt the karma i became you know the more the the and, and what i expected that you know in thinking about death and i think we should all spend more time thinking about death 
uh, I think, in a, in a positive way. It's, it's inevitable, yet we all want to pretend it's never going to happen to us, but it is going to. Um, you know, and trying to keep, keep death as a companion um, in a way that is a, can be a great teacher and a, and a, gr you know, a, great, um, a great source of strength in some way. So what I, what I, what I re thought, what I recognized at the time was happening to me was I thought that uh, the world, I would want to do all these things. All, I, quickly, I'd have to do this. I'd want one more time to do all these things. But in fact, what happened is everything slowed down. And everything became super calm and you know i started really observing the simple things the little things became magical again so i it's it's a it's a it's a feeling that um i've sort of kind of lost as i've gotten further away from that closeness to to it but it, it was it was it was one of the most profoundly beautiful uh feelings you know that i've ever had this this I, this this connection to everything um has never been stronger um you know, and it sounds sort of wanky, you know, to sort of say, you know, Not at all. you know, the, totally agree. Literally, literally seeing the, the, the way that, a you know, a leaf would blow in the wind and noticing every single, you know, um, moment of that and our connection to that and sort of, and that's, you know, with, with meditation and um, I'm a big Sam Harris fan as well. So I, I kind of like, like his approach to mindfulness and, and, and you know, really understanding you know, the, the you know, kind of possible oneness that exists beyond, you know, the physical body that we're in. And, you know, this was, an, this was really enable, enabled me to break through that barrier into somewhere else. And the meditation that I did during that time was uh, profound. It was, it was, you know, I mean, I went places. I can tell you that, like, I, you know, again, sounds weird, but, and I... And, Ayahuasca and, type places? What's that? I, I, Ayahuasca type places? Well, I went to all sorts of places, yeah. Uh, you know, I just went to play other, other, other realms, you know, is the only way I can describe it, right? Um, and and my, able, my ability to get there was, was very, very quick. I could just do, I could be there, any, I, could be, I could be in the moment uh, through a single thought and I could stay there and I could just be in this incredible state. Um, it's been very difficult as I've gotten back into, you know, everyday life. To, to kind of hold on to that as, as, as tightly as I experienced it at that, that time where I'd gone and let go of everything else. So um, it, was, it was incredible. So that's, and that was very much what the mind and soul part, um, I think coming together. So for me, that was, that was an incredible thing. Um, I, I think we lose it because it's very difficult when we're running around doing what we do to maintain that state of mind. Um, and, you know, it's, it sort of takes a lot more practice, a lot more effort. But again, that was one of the great things I, I, I've taken away from it. And the fact that I know that that's there and whether or not I pay attention to it enough, some days or less, some other days, um, I still know it's there. And, and that was something that I, I, I took away from it. Um, you know, and, and, and I have, and there's also this, at the same time, you know, recovering, it's kind of a weird psychological period as well. I think that people have to go through and should be cognizant of um where where you have to kind of get yourself back to adjusting to be well again so although you believe wholeheartedly while you're healing that you will be well there's still this transition that has to happen to come back into the what i call come back into the real world you know from this other state this other place that you are where you need to be when you're healing i think uh, at an intense level of focus and concentration and then you kind of do need to let you know kind of need to let go of some of that baggage let's say uh, in order to kind of live in the real world again, otherwise you could choose to go be a monk on a mountain. But you know, there is this, there is you do need to find that balance again, and and it's a it's a hard thing for me to explain. Um, but you know, I, I think if you want to, you know, anyway, for me at least in what I do, I had to I had to refine some balance of being able to kind of also be back in the world and fight the fight that I fight in the world and play that game, be that be that person, but still rem but still maintain the other the other the other gifts and learnings that I had acquired through, through this, um, through this particular part of my journey. And that's still very much part of my life. I mean, I am very mentally balanced. Um, and, and I think I still live a pretty optimal, you know, healthy lifestyle, um, and focus on my, my health in a way that I, ne I never had before. So, you know, that's, that's all still part of me. Right. Um, and I, and I, I think it will continue. Uh, and, 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 and this, then I, and I, I sort of love going back to that place whenever I want to, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, now, this is not one of the questions on the list that I actually gave you, but I am very curious. Um, 
we, here in Ningbo for the last three and a half years, um, we've actually struggled at essential wellness to try and get across to the public, Chinese and expat, that a plant-based diet is a healing diet. We actually follow a uh, no sugar, no oil, um, plant-based, mm. uh, whole food, plant-based, no oil diet, because it's, a, it's, it has been show, shown as being a healing diet. I'm very curious, based on your journey and your extensive experience as a chef, have you noticed in any way, has that changed what you do from a professional point of view, as in providing people with food? Because, you know, we, we simply do not have enough cele celebrity chefs who have been through this journey and recognize how important food is actually. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a good, it's a really good question. So I, I think one of the things that, I mean, at the moment, um, uh, I don't, okay, let's put it, I mean, let me, let me backtrack. This is a really, really good question, I think. And I, and I went deep into this when, when I, when I started re reconnecting with cooking. Um, and part of, part of my experience through the whole cancer part journey was I kind of also fell back in love with, with cooking in a way that I, I looked at it again differently. And, and a few things that happened was I started really looking again at, you know, simple things like where does the product come from um you know the, the power the power of of old old methods um fermentation you know i really and I, I actually developed a concept called eden um which was really revisiting the idea of everything locally made you know handmade artisanal crafted and a heavy i mean a heavily do it wellness, right yeah, yeah. and I, I mean a heavy and it was a hemp, heavy emphasis on Plant base, a lot of a lot of emphasis on you know, activation, live living food, um, and I created a very beautiful menu um, that was built around that. So that was kind of a you know a Michelin level type you know experience, but done with this. Um, it is deeply embedded into its DNA, and still my one of my all time wow. favorite concepts. Um, so uh, you know, I, it did it did shift the way that I I, I think and cook. Um, I, I'd always considered myself somebody who was who cared about you know nature and the and, and the environment, but it really you know I guess it's some also I was working in the hospitality industry, which you know it, it is what it is, right? There's there's a lot of things that we we just accept. Um, so I, I started looking much more at you know what I call this uh, cruelty-free, do no evil, eat no evil approach to mm -hmm. the kitchen. I, I don't advocate that someone has to be plant-based or not. I, I advocate that, you know, despite what choices I might make, um, I, I think what's more, what's more important because you're not going to change the whole world. Um, at least not, not in one day. Um, what's more important. Not one that, day. Yeah, there is, there is, there needs to be, there needs to be a conversation. We need to allow mm -hmm. that it be a conversation. And so I much believe in walking the middle, the middle path. Um, in, and I think extremes, polarize and stop conversation and i think that's more damaging and does not affect change so being able to come to the center and talk with somebody who has a completely um uh, you know opposite point of view is essential to to, to progress and i think we're, we're living in a time where polarization has become the norm and, and conversation has become you know le less less of the norm you know so i hope that we can get back to that place where it's okay to have a middle ground and to agree to disagree yeah. and find find those commonalities and you know and because it's because it's, it's actually a, a, better, a better way to move forward so my my as a chef my what i what i'm more focused on is you know is, is getting back to kind of the nature and farming um where you know there is there, there is symbiotic farming going on between you know animal human and plant um you know i think industrial farming as the you know, especially industrial meat production is probably one of the greatest crimes, you know, um, of our century. It's, it's mm -hmm. incredibly cruel, horrible, bad, you know, just on, on every level. And then the product that's produced is horrible and bad for us. Um, so it just, it's just broken. That system is completely broken. Um, you know, the journey back, I, I don't think is going, we're not going to get there and you may disagree with me, but we're not going to get there by, you know, forcing one one point of view. I think we're going to get there by coming back to a middle ground, which is what does what should real farming look like? Do we really need to eat this much meat? No, we don't. You know, back to an old way of thinking where, you know, um, you know, 
our, our grandparents and their great grandparents, they maybe ate meat once a week, you know, um, and most of their diet was plant based simply out of necessity more than anything else, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, my, my dad's yeah. Greek, right? My my dad's Greek, and I remember, you know, my grandmother. They would cook a meat dish once a week. The rest of the week was all plant based, um, you know, grains, vegetables, and so on. So, and, and the same, the same would be true in China and, and many other old cultures, right? So, you know, this 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 meat fest is this this idea of shoving meat on everything. You know, having to eat at three meals a day. That's where we've gone terribly wrong, and that's and that's and, you know, and then growing. You know, what eighty percent of the world's plants are, are grown to feed animals. The system's a little bit. Uh, the system's not a little bit. The system is completely broken. So, yeah. um, you know, so that. So again, when I started looking at what produce to to, if I was going to work with that kind of produce, I was going to work with somebody that was raising animals properly, that they lived the right kind of life, and you know, and that the that there was a, you know, a, you know, cruelty free approach to processing it. Right. So that was the view that I took even though I was still choosing to be 100% plant-based myself, I, I was allowing, you know, my diners to know where the animal came from, you know, that it was raised properly, that the farmer had had respect for it and that there was kind of holistic farming going on. So that was kind of like my, where I, where I, where I ended up. Um, uh, so, so, you know, I think a lot of vegans kind of believe there's only, there's only like, it has to be 100%, you know, dedicate to being a vegan. I, I'm, I'm looking at it more from, you know, being living living a plant based lifestyle, um, and mm -hmm. allow allowing for there still to be some room for people who want to, you know, eat meat. But we should shut down and stop cruelty based animal production, no question. Mm -hmm. And chefs chefs should should who should lead that charge because, and consumers should lead that charge because we shouldn't accept it anymore. And I think if we were just able to come to a middle ground there, we'd already make significant change um, in, mm -hmm. in health and in the environment and sustainability. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big, big believer of looking at sustainable practices that will um, live beyond. I don't, I don't believe the big myth that's being sold to us about, um, you know, we can't feed the world. That's absolute rubbish. We can't mm -hmm. feed the world. There's plenty of food and room to feed the world. Um, so, uh, we, we just have to kind of, you know, I guess de-radicalize the conversation and get, mm. get back to a place where we can actually talk about it, you know, and find common solutions, right? Okay. What would be really interesting is to get a few uh, people together for a panel discussion on, online so we can uh, explore this a little bit further because yeah, I think we've, we've definitely come to the, to the yeah. end of our um, yeah. time here. Yeah. Um, a lot of people do not understand that veganism is actually about the animals and plant-based is about the diet, the environment, and health. Mm, mm. Yes, that's and, a good point. Yeah, I myself am vegan for the animals, and I'm whole food, plant-based, no oil for my health and mm. for the health of the planet. And, and I put those two together. But the, I'd just like to finish on this. I think it's incredibly important that we have more chefs, celebrity or chefs or, or just actually ordinary chefs who um, perhaps see the situation as you do, for the simple reason that a lot of people are very reluctant to shift across to a plant-based diet. Hopefully, maybe one day they'll even go vegan for the animals, oh, but oh. that a lot of people are very reluctant for a number of reasons, which unfortunately could be seen as quite selfish in that they're not certain that they're going to meet their nutritional needs. And you've clearly shown, yeah. I've been plant-based 38 years. Both of us show I'm, I'm 57 this year and I am very, very healthy. And you look very, very healthy as a result of a plant-based diet. So to help people to, to, to come across and to see that it's, it's not, they're not going to die. No, of course. No. Because the thing is like, and I, and I, I got into, sorry, I just wanted to say like, make sure I made it clear. Like I love, I love being on plant-based diet. I feel healthier, stronger, better. I love it. So I'm just, sure. I, I always, my point again, just want to make sure that came across is like we do need, and I think you, I love the way that you do seem to really understand this point as a vegan as well, that there, is, that does need to be that middle ground conversation and that transitioning people, you know, will, will be a journey for the planet and, and yes. for humanity, right? Sure. Well, the, 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 the second thing is, and this is very important, someone with your culinary skill is going to make it delicious as well. 
because that's another thing that I find is like we have we have events at Essential Wellness here in Ningbor, and I I have I don't think I have um, you've frozen. I don't think we've ever had a situation where people have not enjoyed the food. They always rave about the food, and it is whole food, plant based, no oil, which is one of the most challenging ways of presenting foods. But it's it's the flavors, and they they always go in and they say there's so much flavor to the food, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I just sort of say you're I eating. I, I mean, I love cooking. I mean, I love cooking plant based. It's it's um. But you know, there's another, there's another. I think I know, I know we're almost out of time, but we there's one other crucial point that I think that vegans should hear for their own health because I, I, I classify vegans in two buckets. You're obviously the healthy vegan bucket, right? So you're the you're you're living a whole food based diet. You 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 know, I'm you know, you look vibrant, you look amazing, like so, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, but you also, you have a you have a lot of unhealthy vegans who. You know, we call them junk food vegans, yeah, right? So, and I think, and they're not doing, they're not doing, they're not doing, you know, they're, they're doing a disservice because people look at them and go, "Oh my God, you look so unhealthy. You're overweight, or you just your skin's terrible, or you know." And you know that they're eating, they're eating junk. They're just choosing to just eat junk. Um, Oreos. Yeah, right. And the thing is, you know, a whole food, plant based diet is what I advocate for as well for optimum health and well being and mental state. Um, and that's very different to what I see some vegans doing, which is frankly alarming um, and will also lead to cancer, <laughs> you know, um, because it's, if you eat a lot of, you know, processed crap food, that's, you know, that's part of the, you know, one of the very high probabilities, right? So. Yeah, we're definitely on the, on the same page there. So, so David, I look forward to interviewing you again. Hopefully we can organize a, an, a, an interesting panel discussion about this and uh, ways that we can start to help people to move forward Wonderful. into so a more healthy, delicious way of eating and also something that is both sustainable for the planet and kinder. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as you know, that's ticked all the boxes, all the boxes. Yeah. Yep. So it was very nice talking to you. Thank you so much. Okay. You take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. If you like this video and want to see more, hit the subscribe button and the bell notification. Ciao, ciao.